Hare Krishna Prabhus. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Recording in progress. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chatsura Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shanyavadi Paschachadeshatarine Vancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevata Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare So welcome everyone to our ongoing study of the third canto Srimad Bhagavatam and we're studying Kapila Shiksha. Today we're going to look at chapter number 31. Okay, everyone can see the PowerPoint. Yes, Maharaj. Yes. Okay, so chapter 31, the movements of the living entities. So you remember chapter 30, we heard about the unfortunate conditioned soul working very hard and then giving up his body and take, being taken to Yamaraj. All right, we heard about him going to the court of Yamaraj to be punished, to be awarded the results of his past activities. So we want to begin this chapter today. We're going to look at this little song, song written for us by Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur. Bhulia Tumari, forgetting you. I'll just read the translation. O Lord, having forgotten you and come to this material world, I've experienced a host of sins and sorrows. Now I approach your lotus feet and submit my tale of woe. So, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur is describing position of the conditioned soul, the time of death, after quitting this material body. Well, he's describing here about his birth. While I was bound up tightly in the unbearable confines of my mother's womb, O Lord, you once revealed yourself before me. After appearing briefly, you abandoned this poor servant of yours. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur is describing the child in the womb, that somehow the child was in such a miserable condition, was suffering so much, the Lord appeared before him. but then quickly disappeared. At that moment I thought, after my birth this time, I will surely worship you with undivided attention. But alas, after taking birth, I fell into the entangling network of worldly illusions. Thus I possessed not even a drop of true knowledge. 
And so this is the unfortunate situation which often arises, that although in the womb the child is in so much difficulty, suffering so much, that he prays to the Lord to be delivered. But then after taking birth, he forgets. Before he was praying, I will surely worship you. But then after taking birth, it's all forgotten and you fall into material life again. Text number four. As a dear son fondled in the laps of attentive relatives, I pass my time smiling and laughing. The affection of my father and mother helped me forget you still more, and I began to think that the material world was a very nice place. Isn't it so common that we fall into this trap, we become enamored with the affection and the, the loving exchanges between the family members and relatives, and it helps us to forget the Supreme Lord more. And we think, we're happy here, we have our family here. Text 5. Day by day, I gradually grew into a young boy and began playing with other boys. Soon my powers of understanding emerged, so I diligently studied my school lessons every day. So Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur now goes on to describe growing up, go to school, begin education, and this way you pass the time. Text 6. Proud of my accomplished education, I later travelled from place to place and earned much wealth, thereby maintaining my family with undivided attention. I forgot you, O Lord Hari. We get education and that education gives us the chance to earn more wealth, more power. And we use that wealth and power just simply for maintaining our family. And we forget our spiritual family. Text 7. Now in old age, this Bhakti Vinod very sadly weeps as death approaches. I fail to worship you, O Lord, and instead pass my days in vain. What will be my fate now? So this is the unfortunate position we can often find ourselves in. Old age comes, we're close to death, and we realize we've passed so many days we did not worship the Lord. All right, so we're on chapter 31. We'll just have a quick look at what happened in the other chapters, what we covered so far. In chapter 25, we had Devahuti lamenting her situation, that her husband had gone away and left her. And she told Lord Kapila, I am bewildered by Maya. Please dispel my illusion. And she asked Lord Kapila, What kind of bhakti should I perform to attain you easily? Explain the process of jnana and yoga. How many limbs do they have? So these were some of the inquiries of Devahuti in chapter 25. Then chapter 26, we heard the analytical description of the different elements of creation. All the different elements were explained in their characteristics. And we're encouraged to have faith in this knowledge. This is the path of jnana, chapter 26, the path of jnana, knowledge. 
understanding all these different elements of the material creation and how they all originate with the different senses and sense organs. Then chapter 27 and 28 goes on to describe how we can use this knowledge to become liberated. We can learn the difference between the living entity or the jiva and the material nature, the prakriti. We learn also the limbs of Astanga Yoga and we, we heard about the different uh, activities, what you have to do in the different limbs and that went on to describe the form of the Lord because part of the Astanga Yoga requires meditation on the Lord's form, the super soul within the heart. So that the Lord's form was described for us. Then chapter 29, more inquiries by Devahuti. She wanted to know about the path of bhakti. What is this path of bhakti? Describe it to me. So it was described, we heard about bhakti in the modes and we heard about pure bhakti. So various kinds of bhakti, character and the characteristic of pure bhakti. And Devahuti wanted to hear about this pure bhakti, unadulterated devotional service. So that was chapter 29. And in chapter 29, Devahuti also inquired from Lord Kapila. Here, we'll put it on the slide, the connection with the previous chapter. Actually, we're on chapter 31, but this is a quote from chapter 29. Devahuti, in text 3 and 4, she said, my dear Lord, please also describe in detail, both for me and for people in general, the continual process of birth and death. For by hearing of such calamities, we may become detached from the activities of this material world. So hearing of such calamities, right? Birth and death. <laughs> birth is a calamity as well. For the person taking birth is a calamity. Of course, mother and father are happy, but for the child taking birth, it's a calamity. Taking birth and then dying. That, that, that may be a calamity for the relatives, but in some way it can be a great relief for the living entity to give up the material body. Okay, so hearing these calamities, hearing about birth and death, we can become detached from the material world. Devahuti also went on to inquire, Please also describe eternal time, which is a representation of your form, and by whose influence people in general engage in the performance of pious activities. So we, we did speak about time that came up in chapter number 30. It was also there at the end of chapter 29. That came up more in chapter 30. Now, this chapter, we're going to hear about the living entity, how he's moving in different forms of life. First we will hear about the soul, how the soul takes birth, enters into the mother's womb and how he suffers. As he, as he develops a body, he suffers in the womb of the mother. And then texts 11 to 21, we'll hear about the prayers offered by the embryo in the womb. Now these prayers are not offered by every child. But there are some children, some children, pious children, who are, you know, have that tendency to pray to the Lord, that when they're in the womb of the mother, they may pray. Not all children will do that, though. 
that sometimes it's misunderstood. Sometimes we think all the children in the womb pray. Not true. Then text 22 to 31, we'll hear what happens after the child takes birth. After coming out of the womb, how, while he's in the womb, he's praying to get out, but when he gets out, he forgets. Forgetfulness comes, just like we just read Bhaktivinoda Thakur's song. Forgetfulness comes after birth. And then we will hear about the danger of bad association. It's a very important point. Association, so important. We have to know what is good association and what is bad. So that's text 32 to 42. And the final verses in the chapter, we'll hear how we can reclaim our original nature. So those are the different sections of this chapter, 31, quite a long chapter, 48 verses. All right, so here's the first verse. The soul suffers in the mother's womb. Certainly, child suffers in the mother's womb. When the mother goes to the hospital, the doctors will often give, they will give advice to the pregnant woman. You have to be careful what you eat and what you do. And if you pour hot liquids into your, into your stomach, it's going to burn the child. And so many things, the spicy food and so on, it's all going to harm the, the tender skin of the child who is within the womb. Anyway, the first verse, very important verse, text one, Sri Bhagavan Uvacha Karmana Daiva Netrena Jantur Deho Papatai. Right? This is the famous part of the verse, often quoted. Karmana Daiva Netrina. The living entity takes birth under the control of two things, under the supervision of the Lord and according to the results of his work. So karma, karmana, daiva netrina, the supervision of the Lord. Uh, translation, the personality of God has said. Under the supervision of the Supreme Lord and according to the result of his work, the living entity, the soul, is made to enter into the womb of a woman through the particle of male semen to assume a particular type of body. So this is the law. According to the results of his work and under the supervision of the Supreme Lord. We enter into the womb. All of us, we took birth in that particular manner, according to karma and daiva nitrina. Text number two. We're going to hear how the child, the body of the child in the womb, begins to develop, right? From the time of conception, on the first night, the sperm and ovum mix. And on the fifth night, the mixture ferments into a bubble. On the tenth night, it develops into a form, like a plum. And after that, it gradually turns into a lump of flesh or an egg, as the case may be. Right? Some living entities, of course, like the birds, they're born in eggs. We, we are, the humans, they, we take birth as lumps of flesh. Mm. Different species have different methods of taking their birth. Okay, going ahead, text number three. In the course of a month, a head is formed, and at the end of two months, the hands, feet, and other limbs 
take shape. By the end of three months, the nails, fingers, toes, bodily hair, bones, and skin appear, as do the organ of generation and the other apertures in the body, namely the eyes, nostrils, ears, mouth, and anus. So we're hearing how the body of the child develops. We heard first night, then the, the fifth night, then the tenth night, then in the course of a month, the head. And now two months, the limbs, hands and feet, and three months, the fingers, and the nails and the bones. We can see how the body is developing. Text number four. Within four months from the date of conception, the seven essential ingredients of the body, namely child, blood, flesh, fat, bone, marrow, and semen, come into existence. At the end of five months, hunger and thirst make themselves felt. And at the end of six months, the fetus, enclosed by the amnion, am, am begins to move in, to the right side of the abdomen. So, this is Vedic embryology. We're hearing how the embryo is developing according to the Vedic philosophy. Right? Four months the different ingredients become manifest in the body. At the end of five months, hunger and thirst. Mother becomes, wants to, has to eat more, drink more, because the child also wants to eat and drink. And then six months, then the fetus begins to move to the right side of the abdomen. Right? Child has to be properly situated in order to come out of the womb. So it's important that the child moves over to the right side of the abdomen. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yeah. Uh, may I ask a question, please? Okay. Uh, Maharaj, what do you mean by amnion? Well, you know, I'm not a doctor and I don't know this word myself, you know. <laughs> The fetus enclosed by the amnion. Hmm. But I'll have to look this up in the dictionary to tell you the truth. Yes, Maharaj. Before the end of the class, I will tell you. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. I'm not so familiar with <laughs> children taking birth. or I don't know about all these things. All right. But it says in the dictionary that amnio means the innermost membrane that encloses the, the embryo of a mammal, bird, or reptile. It's a membrane, innermost membrane. Innermost membrane. That encloses the embryo of a mammal, bird, or reptile. Oh, it doesn't say human, huh? No, it doesn't say human. That's, oh. that's the dictionary meaning. Oh. Krishna? Yes? Amnion, it is sick. In which fluid in which the embryo lies. Embryo is being protected by the amniotic fluid. The oh. amnion is sick. That's what it says here. It said the embryo is enclosed by the amnion. Yeah. It's sick. Okay. So that's it. Your, that's your knowledge or that's from a dictionary, Prabhu? Uh, I'm in Dr. Maharaj. Huh? I'm doctor. Oh, you're a doctor. I see. Okay, then you should know, right? Yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you, Prabhupada. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Prabhupada. Good to have you here. <laughs> so, doctor knows. So, the, yeah, the, the, the embryo is enclosed. At the end of six months, the fetus, enclosed by the amnion, begins to move to the right side. Okay? So? This is important for our preaching. It shows something of the creditability of the Vedic knowledge. 
that there's very close similarity between the Vedic evidence and modern medical science. They, they pretty much agree with each other. We point out Vedic science, however, is based on scriptural revelation, whereas the later, the latter, the latter being medical science, modern medical science, depends on empirical observation using microscopes, ultrasound, and the last generation 3D scanning. Okay, so modern medical science can confirm the Vedic version. Thus the advancements of modern technology, which broadens the limits of human sensory perception, simply come to confirm the authenticity of Vedic revelation. So, yes, Vedic revelation, the Vedic knowledge is, is confirmed with the advancement of technology. They're finding that what the Vedas say is actually true. There's nothing wrong in the Vedas, it's perfect knowledge. The medical, it's just sometimes our knowledge is not up to date. But in course of time it all becomes clear, it all becomes confirmed. All right. So what about the condition in the womb, suffering in the womb? Text 5 continues, text 5 of our chapter 31 continues. Deriving its nutrition from the food and drink taken by the mother, the fetus grows and remains in that abominable residence of stools and urine which is the breeding place of all kinds of worms. We can understand it's not a very pleasant place to be residing for so many months. But this is a, the law of nature. The fetus is put into this condition. In the womb of the mother, he has to remain there. And that place is full of stools and urine and all kinds of worms are breeding there. At the same time, the mother is taking food and drink. It's all coming in there, so the child is in that unfortunate condition. Text number six continues. Bitten again and again all over the body by the hungry worms in the abdomen itself, the child suffers terrible agony because of the tenderness, tenderness of the skin of the child, because the worms are biting its tender skin, so the poor living entity is really suffering. He thus becomes unconscious moment after moment because of the terrible condition. So because of the terrible condition, he's suffering, it's all suffering. He, he didn't take birth yet, he's suffering. <laughs> We're thinking, sometimes we think, oh, the suffering begins when you take birth, but even before birth, suffering, from the time, just the time entering into the womb, it's described here, terrible agonies because he's being bitten by these worms and certainly the worms are going to be there inside the intestines. So the child is in so much agony that sometimes he's conscious, other unconscious, moment after moment. Text number seven. Owing to... Uh, uh, I Krishna Maharaj, can I ask a quick question please? Okay. Uh, before I begin, happy Vyasa Puja. Thank you. Maharaj, uh, you know, just going through these verses, it seems like such a hellish condition for the living entity. Uh, does, number one, does all living entities go through this process of the suffering? And secondly, what about devotees when they take birth in the wombs of mothers? 
uh, so devotees and also let's say liberated souls like Srila Prabhupada does everyone experience the exact same thing like how it's been described here well uh, certainly there will be degrees degrees of suffering it's going to vary some children will suffer more than others a lot has to do with the activities of the mother and of course if the parents are very pure and God conscious so when they beget the child according to religious principles they'll beget they'll attract a very pure soul into the womb and the pure soul is going to be somewhat detached from the material situation because he's in a higher level of consciousness so although he's in the womb he may not be so badly affected as a normal child but certainly most children normal children conceived by the conditioned souls who beget children without any regard for religious principles the child it's not going to be of a, of a very high quality and he's going to suffer he's going he will, he will experience suffering and being in the womb the mother will as i said will take hot things and spicy things and sometimes the mother even may drink alcohol and different things like that which burn the skin of the child so yeah for most most children it's it's suffering there's a lot of suffering there in the, that's why it's described here lord kapila wants us all to understand the nature of birth in the material world we often are oblivious to the fact that there's so much suffering here so lord kapila is pointing out to us the suffering even before birth. All right? So text, you, text number Thank seven you. describes, owing to the mothers eating bitter, pungent foodstuff, or food which is too salty or too sour, the body of the child incessantly suffers pains which are almost intolerable. so it's certainly a problem you know most people uh, most pregnant ladies that they, they can't control their tongues and because they're feeding a child as well and they eat and they'll eat a lot and they will eat things like the salt too salty too sour spicy different things they will take all which will bring pain and suffering for the child because a newborn child naturally the skin is very very tender and so these things they'll just they'll cause so much pain so much misery for the child going ahead text number eight placed within the amnion and covered outside by the intestines the child remains lying on one side of the abdomen his head turned towards his belly and his back and neck arched like a bow all right so you can just imagine the position is laying on one side of the abdomen his head turned towards his belly okay put the head down on the belly and his back and neck arched like a bow it's not a very pleasant condition and you're covered text nine the child thus remains just just like a bird in a cage without freedom of movement at that time if the child is fortunate 
he can remember all the troubles of his past 100 births and he grieves wretchedly. What is the possibility of peace of mind in that condition? Oh, so the description is there, like a bird in a cage without freedom of movement. So the child in the abdomen is like that, very difficult to move at all. But if, if he's fortunate, now as we said, some children are fortunate. It will depend on their, some scars, and that will, you know, the, their parents' behavior will be also, uh, uh, that will be related to the quality of the soul who is attracted into the womb. So if the child is fortunate, the child can remember all the troubles of his past 100 births. Oh, so you can understand how many births we have taken in this material world. So many births we have had. We don't remember any of them. But apparently at this time, when the child is there in the womb, he can remember and he grieves very, un very regrettably. So no possibility of peace in that condition. Text number 10. Thus endowed with the development of consciousness from the seventh month after his conception, the child is tossed downward by the airs that press the embryo during the weeks preceding delivery. Like the worms born of the same filthy abdominal cavity, he cannot remain in one place. So consciousness is developed there within the body of the child from the seventh month after his conception. And then the heirs toss the child down getting ready for delivery. Of course, only seven months. It's going to be a, a couple of months before the child's going to be delivered. But the heirs press down before the delivery. After birth, the child may forget about the difficulties of his past life. But when we are grown up, we can at least understand the grievous tortures undergone at birth and death by reading the authorized scriptures like Srimad Bhagavatam. If we do not believe in the scriptures, that is a different question. But if we have faith in the authority of such descriptions, then we must prepare for our freedom in the next life. And that is possible in this human form of life. One who does not take heed of these indications of suffering in human existence is said to be undoubtedly committing suicide. And so the suffering is a warning to us that we don't belong here. We have to get out of this world. Continuing, it is said that this human form of life is the only means for crossing over the nescience of maya or material existence. We have a very efficient boat in this human form of body and there is a very expert ca captain, the spiritual master. The scriptural injunctions are like favorable winds. If we do not cross over the ocean of the nations of material existence, in spite of all these facilities, then certainly we are all intentionally committing suicide. So, <laughs> Prabhupada's purport gives a strong warning to us that we have to make use of this human form of life. That's a great opportunity, right? So the human form of life is 
the boat to cross over the ocean of material existence. And we have the help of the captain, the spiritual master, and we have also the favourable breeze, the winds to carry us across the ocean, which are there in the form of the teachings from the scriptures. So everything is there. All facilities are there to help us to cross over this ocean of material existence. And if we don't take advantage, then we are very foolish, like people who commit suicide. So this is from chapter 30, text number 9. We were just reading the purport there, it's relevant. Hi Krishna Maharaj, can I ask uh, yeah. two quick questions please? All right. Maharaj, uh, just going through these verses, I had a thought and I need some enlightenment. You know, I've heard so many variations on this particular question. The living entity, you know, how, how does it come into womb of a certain mother or father? Is it due to its karmic activities by laws of nature? Does a soul choose the parents for further spiritual advancement? How does that take place? Well, we quoted the verse, right? Karmana daiva, daiva netrina, by karma and by the will of God, the Supreme Lord places the soul into the womb, which is most appropriate for that soul. So it's not by chance, it's all by the, under the control of the Supreme Lord, that he knows each and every living entity's qualification, and he knows their past. So according to the will of the Lord and according to the living entity's qualification, he's put into the appropriate situation to continue his material existence. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. Just my second question is, uh, you mentioned that, you know, um, only certain pious souls would offer praise to the Supreme Lord. So is it offering praise to the Supreme Lord or getting the audience of the Supreme Lord while in the womb? And, and then just further on to that, how is it then, why would the Supreme Lord give the audience to that living entity and then after birth, the living entity forgets? I'm just trying to understand the reasoning behind that. Well, we should understand it's not the general situation, but there may be some fortunate souls who can see the Lord. They may be blessed with the divine vision, but it's not for everyone. Some fortunate souls may see the Lord when they're in the womb. Just like we know Maharaj Parikshit, the Lord came and saved him from the heat of the Brahmastra weapon. But it's, it's not that it happens to every child, but certain children may be very fortunate. One, one reason is because they're suffering and they appreciate the misery of the existence and they actually pray to the Lord. Because when, there, when we're in difficulty, we have that nature. When we're, that we often pray, we write prayer. You know, people who never pray, when they're in danger, they will pray. When their life's threatened, they may pray. And usually they never pray, never. But somehow, when the danger comes, they'll pray to God. Oh, <laughs> and even little children, we would see little children you know, when the exams come and they give out the marks, then they'll pray to God, oh, give me a good mark. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like that. That when we want something, when, or when we're in a really difficult situation, then we'll remember God, we'll pray to Him, we turn to Him for help. Oh, God, help me. We don't even know who God is, but we'll ask Him, please help me, give me a good mark, save me. So it's like that. Is that okay? Yes, thank you. And then just that last part was, and why does the Lord make the living entity forget? <laughs> you know, obviously they got the audience of the Lord and then they forget once taking birth. 
Well, it's not that the Lord makes the living entity forget, but the living entity himself forgets because his devotion is not so pure. That sometimes we are like that. When we're in the difficult situation, we'll remember God. But as soon as there's no more difficulties, then we forget Him. You know, when, when we're in trouble, we pray to God, Oh, say, but as soon as we get money and we have no problem, then we just think of the money and enjoy the money. When we don't have any money, we're praying to God, Oh, give me money, give me a job, give me, help me, save me. But when we have it, we don't. We don't bother. It's our, it's our free will. The Lord does not force him, he does not force the living entities to pray to him. But according to the natures of the living entities, some will forget him. Their material desires are satisfied. They don't need God anymore. They think the Lord is there simply as their order supplier. Thank you, Maharaj. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead. Here we have prayers in the womb. All right, so the, we're up to text number, well that was text number, the last one was text number 10, right? Yes. So we're beginning text number 11. Mm. Oh, here we have text 11 on the screen for us actually. The living entity in this frightful condition of life bound by seven layers of material ingredients, prays with folded hands, appealing to the Lord who has put him in that condition. Oh, Krishna. All right. So, does somebody have a book there? I have to turn on my... Yes, Maharaj. Would you like to read Prabhupada, text number 12? Okay, Maharaj. Uh, shall I read the translation, uh, Maharaj? Yes, just the translation, Prabhu, yeah. Okay, text number 12, uh, translation. The human soul says, I take shelter of the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who appears in his various eternal forms and walks on the surface of the world. I take shelter of him only because he can give me relief from all fear and from him. I have received this condition of life which is just befitting my impious activities. Okay. Would you like to keep reading, Prabhu? Okay, Maharaj. Uh, text 30, translation. I, the pure soul appearing uh, now bound by my activities, am lying in the womb of my mother by the arrangement of Maya. I offer my respectful obeisances unto him, who is also here with me but who is unaffected and chainless. He is unlimited, but he is perceived in the repentant heart. To him, I offer my respectful obeisances. All right, so we can see the prayer here. Uh, shall I continue, Maharaj? No, just a minute, Prabhu. i just comment a little on this verse. The, the, the pure soul, I, the pure soul, the soul is pure, but we're covered by so many different desires and different reactions of our past activities. So we're now, as he says, I bound by my activities, laying in the womb of my mother by the arrangement of Maya. The arrangement of Maya means Maya is the energy of the Lord. We said karmana daiva netrina, by, by karma and by the will of the Lord. So the soul, this child in the womb, prays to the Lord, offers obeisances unto the Lord. And he says, the Lord is also here with me. So the Lord is there in the womb, but the Lord is not affected. He's unaffected and changeless. So we see the Lord can be, he's everywhere. He's also in the womb. He's not affected. He's, he's unaffected. He's unlimited, but he's only seen by the repentant heart. So repentance is a very important qualification. We have to regret that we have been very fallen and very sinful 
and we have to really want to change our heart. Okay, so we'll go ahead Prabhu, yeah, you want to keep reading Prabhu? Yes, Maharaj, uh, text 14, translation. Yes. I am, I am separated from the Supreme Lord because of my being in this material body, which is made of five elements, and therefore my qualities and senses are being misused, although I am essentially spiritual. Because the Supreme Personality of Godhead is transcendental to material nature and the living entities, because he is devoid of such a material body and because he is always glorious in his spiritual quality, I offer my obeisances unto him. So we see this soul within the womb. That previous, previously, the previous verse said he was, the Lord was with him, but now in this verse he's saying that the Lord is not here. <laughs> he's saying, I said, I'm in the womb. <laughs> the living entity admits he's in the womb, but but the Lord, he doesn't he doesn't recognize the Lord. Is, he is always, because the Lord, well, what does he say? He said, uh, the Supreme Personality of God, transcendental to the material nature, devoid of material body. Okay, and because he's always glorious in his spiritual activities, I offer my, so, oh, all right, yeah. Uh, so the living entity is in the womb, he's covered by the material body. His qualities and senses are being misused. In uh, other words, he's a conditioned soul. He admits he's a conditioned soul. He didn't know how to properly use his qualities and senses for the service of the Lord. So he's been placed into a material body. But he understands his spiritual nature. So, so you can understand this kind of soul is quite an advanced soul. He's taking birth, but he's quite advanced. He understands he's a soul. Okay, go ahead, Prabhu. Maharaj, may I ask one question, small yeah. question? Yeah, please. Yeah, Maharaj, in text uh, uh, 13, uh, the soul felt that there is a presence of the Lord, right? And in the, uh, in the next uh, text, like text 14, he he considers himself to be separated from the Lord. So how in one text the soul is finding Supreme Personality of Godhead with him and in the other text he is thinking that he is separated? Well, it could mean when the Lord, when the living entity is separated, it's like his, his desire is separated from the Lord. He's not in oneness, he's not in harmony with the Lord. Okay, Maharaj. Understood, Maharaj. Yes. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, sorry, uh, just a quick question, please. Yes. Um, mentions about the five elements. So at what point does the five elements start forming body? In text two, it says that, uh, you know, on the fifth night, mixture ferments into a bubble. And then day after, uh, it says into a lump of flesh. So these five elements that our material body is made up of, at what point does it uh, start forming the body? Is it from the initial stage? Uh, from the initial yeah, Well, yes, that's what we heard. We heard the flesh. You know, the flesh comes on the body. It's very tender. And then we heard gradually the formation of the different limbs of the body, and then the fingers and so on, and the nails and hair. And then we heard how uh, the different elements also came into the body and consciousness then came. So gradually, one after another, everything appeared. Right? Okay. Okay, Maharaj, uh, the super soul, Chirakshaya Vishnu, uh, is the, the super soul always with the living entity when it's in a material body or in the subtle body or 
as the super soul come in to the heart when the body is being formed. I'm just trying to understand that. Well, the super soul accompanies the living entity. So when the living entity enters into that womb, the super soul comes with him. The super soul, of God, the living entity, he has to enter into that particle of semen and he has to develop the body. But the Lord, who is the, the super soul, he is not going to, he's not going to change, he's not going to be taking a body or anything but he accompanies the living entity. And together, they're in the heart. The living entity is, is yeah, he's going to enter into the womb of the mother, through the semen of the father, he enters into the womb of the mother, and gradually the body develops. So the soul is there, and along with the soul is a super soul. Throughout, the, throughout the, the creation, throughout the development of the body, the super soul will be there. Yeah? Thank you, Maharaj. All right, that's text number. Uh, yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, please, could you, in this text number 13, this purport, uh, could you please explain this again? The individual soul becomes repentant, that he forgets, forgot his constitutional position wanted to become one with the Supreme Soul and tried his best to lord it over material nature. So could you explain this line once again, Maharaj? Well, this is why we're in the material world, that we have the tendency that we want to lord over the material nature, right? We're the, we are the prakriti of the lord, but we ha we're always struggling with the mind and senses. And the mind and senses, they want to dominate, they want to control, they want to exploit the resources of the material nature. You know, we're thinking, I don't have enough, I need more, I, I want more money, I want more. We're always trying to get more. So this is the problem why we're in the material world, but when the child is within the womb, the, the, at that time he sees the Supreme Lord and he sees the Lord, how the Lord is unlimited. And so it's described, he is, he, the Lord, that su Supreme Lord, who is the super soul, he is perceived in the repentant heart. So we have to feel regret and sorrow that we're fallen and sinful, that we've exploited material world that we had the tendency to want to enjoy independent of the Lord. So when we regret that, then we, we're more able to perceive the Lord. Yes? You understand, Maharaji? Yes, Mother. Thank you, Maharaji. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll go ahead. Oh, here's a quote here from the purport of text 13. It is said here, Atapyamana ridae vasitam. He is in the heart of every living entity, but he can be realized only by a soul who is repentant. The individual soul becomes repentant that he forgot his constitutional position, wanted to go, wanted to become one with the Supreme Soul and tried his best to lord it over material nature. He has been baffled and therefore he is repentant. Okay, he has been baffled, been baffled, he's been defeated by the Lord, been trying to lord over and then he realizes he can't do it. So he becomes repentant. Alright, text number 15. Who would like to read for us? Someone? 
Uh, Maharaj, may I read it? Please, Maharaj, yeah. Yes, thank you, Maharaj. Okay, text number 15. The human soul, just hold on. The human soul for the praise. The living entity is put under the influence of material nature and continues a hard struggle for existence on the path of repeated birth and death. This constitutional life is due to his forgetfulness of his relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, without the Lord's mercy, how can he again engage in the transcendental loving service of the Lord? Hmm. Okay, so the, the living entity is praying. It's a hard struggle for existence. <laughs> the path of birth and death. So the, the soul in the womb is remembering the lives, the different struggles which he's had, previous lives, birth and death. And the, this conditional life, is his forgetfulness of re relationship with the Lord. Because we have forgotten Krishna, because we have forgotten our relationship with the Lord, because we have tried to enjoy and to exploit the material world, therefore we are in this condition. So without the Lord's mercy, how can he again engage in the transcendental loving service of the Lord? This is a problem. We need to have the mercy. Without the mercy of the Lord, then we cannot do service. All right. We'll go ahead. Text number 16. Keep reading, Mariji. Yes, Maharaj. Text number 16. No one other than the Supreme Personality of Godhead, uh, as the localized uh, Paramatma, the partial representation of the Lord is directing all inanimate and animate objects. He is present in the three phases of time past, present and future. Therefore, the conditioned soul is engaged in different activities by his direction. And in order to get free from the three four miseries of the conditioned life, we have to surrender onto him only. Okay, yes. We have to surrender to the Supreme Lord. He's the only one who can really save us. Keep reading. Text 17. Fallen into the pool of blood, stool and urine, within the abdomen of his master, of his mother, he, his own body, scorched, scorched by the mother's gastric fire, and embodied soul, anxious to get out, counts his months and prays, O oh my Lord, when shall I, a wicked soul, be released from this confinement? No, oh, right. So this is a prayer. When will I, a wretched soul, be released from this confinement? Because it's such a miserable place. It's stool and urine and blood. And we're in that filthy, dark place within the body. And we're scorched by the gastric fire, <laughs> unable to get out. We have to stay there for months. Oh, Krishna, save us. All right, prayers in the womb. Arguments may be put forward as to why we have been put under the influence of this material energy by the supreme will of the Lord. This is explained in Bhagavad Gita, where the Lord says, I am sitting in everyone's heart, and due to me one is forgetful or one is alive in knowledge. The forgetfulness of the conditioned soul is also due to the direction of the Supreme Lord. Yeah, the forgetfulness, right? Krishna says, Sarvasya Chahamrudi Sane Visto, Madaksmitir Gyanam Apohanamcha. He's in the hearts of all living entities, and from him comes knowledge, remembrance, and forgetfulness. So we want to forget the nature of conditioned life. Krishna allows it. 
He knows the desire of every living entity. And because of Krishna, somebody is forgetful, somebody else is alive in knowledge. So this is Bhagavad Gita, the, the Super Soul acts like this. And so Super Soul is also there in the womb. <laughs> he's influencing the, and he's in the heart of the living entity, guiding him, telling him what he wants, what, what's his desire. Okay, another quote from text 15. A living entity misuses his little independence when he wants to lord it over material nature. This misuse of independence, which is called maya, is always available. Otherwise, there would be no independence. Independence implies that one can use it properly or improperly. It is not static, it is dynamic. Therefore, misuse of independence is the cause of being influenced by maya. The cause of being influenced by maya. Misuse of our independence, right? We're given that little bit of independence and we misuse it. We can use it properly or not. And when we misuse it, then we become influenced by the maya, by the illusion. More about maya. Maya is so strong that the Lord says that it is very difficult to surmount her influence. But one can do so very easily if he surrenders unto me. Anyone who surrenders unto him can overcome the influence of the stringent laws of material nature. It is clearly said here that a living entity is put under the influence And if one wants to get out of this entanglement, this can be made, this can be made possible simply by His mercy. All right? So this is the situation. Very difficult to get over maya. Deva hi esha guna mei mama maya dura. Very difficult to overcome maya. But anyone who surrenders unto Krishna can overcome. The, so if we surrender to Krishna, then we can do it. So the living entity is put under the influence of maya by the will of the Supreme Lord. And if we want to get out of this, we have to get the mercy of the Lord. Why does Krishna put us under the influence of Maya? He understands our nature, our desire to be independent. More text six, from text 16, as the super soul is seated within the heart of the living entity, and when the living entity is serious, the Lord directs him to take shelter of his representative, a bona fide spiritual master. Directed from within and guided externally by the spiritual master, one attains the path of consciousness, which is the way out of the material clutches, and one's life is blessed. So this is part of surrender to Krishna, that we have to take the shelter of a representative of Krishna, and under their guidance they can help us to get free from the material clutches. Okay, we'll go ahead. Text number 18. Who would like to read? Hare Krishna Maharaj, can I read? Please, Prabhu. 331.18. My dear Lord, by your causeless mercy, I am awakened to consciousness, although I am only 10 months, 10 months old. For this causeless mercy of the Supreme Person of Godhead, the friend of all fallen souls, there is no way to express my gratitude but to pray with folded hands. Okay. 
So now, ten months old, ten months have passed from the time of conception. So it's coming to the definitely a child is ready to come out of the womb. So he's awakened to consciousness and the, the living entity describes his gratitude to the Supreme Lord. And he's praying with folded hands for the mercy of the Lord. Okay. Yes. Go Mahesh, ahead. May I, may I ask one question? Yes. Maharaj, actually when the child is born, uh, then he has uh, less uh, developed consciousness. He cannot speak and he cannot, I mean, uh, he, he does not have that much consciousness to understand who is the Lord and how he can make these kind of elaborate prayers and he can understand his repentant nature because of his misuse of independence. So that kind of uh, brain development or intelligence development, is it having so that these kind of elaborate prayers he may do in the womb? Well, we have to understand that the, the consciousness of the living entity is there with the soul, right? It's not depending on the material body. The consciousness is carried from the previous life. That consciousness which we had developed over many lives in the material world. So that consciousness accompanies the soul. Certainly it's a symptom of the soul. It's a consciousness which is a symptom of the soul. As the sunlight is the symptom of the sun. Consciousness is the symptom of the soul. And so to, to offer prayers to the Lord and to remember the, the relationship with the Lord, it is not material. It's coming due to the consciousness which the living entity had acquired. Yes, Maharaj. So basically, uh, when, he's, uh, when the soul is in the womb, it is in a kind of a spiritual consciousness. And when he's outside the womb, he is entrapped into the material consciousness. Well, the soul, it, it's not that the soul is in, uh, the soul is always pure, but at different times it's covered. You see, certainly, as we hear, when the soul takes birth, the living entity becomes enamored by the material energy, and he forgets his spiritual position. It's like that, that when he's in the womb and he's in great difficulty, he's praying to the Lord. Oh, just get me out of here. Certainly I will worship you. But as soon as we get out, oh, it's so easy to forget. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. We will be hearing what happens to the living entity. Now he's in the womb and he's suffering and he's praying to the Lord. I will certainly worship you, just let me out. He's suffering so much difficulty, very cramped conditions and not pleasant at all. A lot of suffering, worms are biting the tender skin and the mother also, she's feeling also difficulty, she wants to eat things and drink things which are going to harm the skin of the child. So the child in the womb is really in a difficult position there and he's praying to the Lord. Some fortunate ch children pray to the Lord but when he gets out then it's, it's real easy to forget again. Okay, keep reading. Okay. Maharaj, just a quick question, if that's okay. Okay. So, Maharaj, this subject matter is a bit foreign to me, I'll be honest, as well. Uh, here it's saying in verse 18, although I am 10 months old, uh, but as far as my knowledge, seeing from other people, you know, it takes place at nine months or earlier. But, like, by whose arrangement does that but also take place? Is it by the Lord when time has come for the child to take birth? But sometimes we even find that, you know, parents arrange with the doctors 
prematurely, prematurely uh, for the birth to take place of the child. So I'm just trying to uh, figure this out because here it's saying 10 months, but I know normally it's nine months or even earlier. Well, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was in the womb for many months before he took birth. He was in the womb, I think it was 14 months before he took birth. And he was waiting, and his, uh, the, the father of Sachimata, Nilamba Chakravarti, he was a great astrologer, and he understood that the child was waiting for an auspicious time to take birth. So sometimes it's like that. And you, you see also Lord Krishna also, he was in the womb for some time before taking birth. It wasn't, I think it was more than the usual time. So, yeah, and Sukadeva Goswami, he didn't want to come out, right? Sukadeva Goswami was in the womb for six, 16 years. And then you have also when Diti was pregnant with Haranyakashipu and Haranyaksha, she kept them in her womb for a long time, I think a hundred years or something, before she gave birth. <laughs> so, so there are a lot of different cases. Okay, and Raj, then regarding like ordinary living entities like myself, you know, uh, how, who determines at what time or at what particular date the living entity takes birth? Is it preordained? Is it by the Lord's arrangement? Well, and it's time for this. Everything, we said karma and daiva netrina. Yes, by according to our karma and the laws of na the laws of nature, the will of God and the laws of nature. These two things. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Of course, nowadays people do things like cesarean operations and so on. And sometimes even people, they will wait, they will pick up a particularly auspicious time and say, this is when I want my child to be brought out of the womb, you know. They will calculate, very, you know, it's not done in a proper way, but they, they try to take advantage. They try to change the karma by having their child take birth at a, an astrologically good time. <laughs> it's not quite proper. Not proper at okay. all. Is there repercussions to that, Maharaj? If someone has like C section uh, in that instance? Well, you can't cheat God. <laughs> we, you know, we try to do these things, we try to take advantage, we try to control the material nature ourselves. You can't do it. You know, the, this, we, we just end up cheating our own self. The Supreme Lord is the Supreme Controller. And we have to surrender to Him. Okay, text 19. The living entity in another type of body sees only by instinct. He knows only the agreeable and disagreeable sense perceptions of that particular body. But I have a body in which I can control my senses and can understand my destination. Therefore, I offer my respectful obeisances to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, by whom I have been blessed with this body and by whose grace I can see him, within and without." <laughs> this is a very interesting prayer from the living entity. Mm. So we see by instinct, we know, we know what, what we like and what we don't like. So, Different things appear to be agreeable and disagreeable. But the living entity says, I can control my senses and understand my destination. Well, that's very good. If you can control the senses and you can understand what his actual destination is. Uh, Maharaj, may I ask one question in this one? Yes. 
Actually, Maharaj, uh, that in the previous works, like generally it is seen that uh, the birth time is nine months. So you mentioned that in different cases, different uh, duration is taken by the body to come out of the womb. And in this one, it is said that uh, it sees only by instinct. So this instinct is basically uh, some kind of nature of the living entity or the sanskaras of the living entity by which it has acquired some desires. So he sees another type of body means what? The first sentence in the text 19, the living entity, another type of body sees only by instinct. The living entity in another type of body sees only by instinct. Well, yeah, the living entity, remember, he's spiritual by nature. He's, he's in his, his spirit, the spirit soul was there. What does Prabhupada talk about it in the, in the purport here? Prabhupada talks about the, the different species, how there are different forms of life and different consciousness, different stages of evolution. And the human form is supposed to be the highest because we have the maximum consciousness. It's a, the opportunity to get out of birth and death. And the fortunate child in the womb, he can understand his good his, his, his superior situation, that he has an opportunity better than other forms of life. The animals and the trees and the fish, all the, they don't have the same opportunity which the human have. And so bodily, the, you know, different bodily necessities, the human form of life, consciousness is so developed that we can understand our position and we can realize ourselves, and we can come to understand the Supreme Lord. So the living entity, uh, Prabhupada talks about, he comments about the, how the living entity said he can control the senses and the mind. So, material life is a problem if you can't control the mind and senses. Prabhupada said we should feel, we should feel grateful to Krishna for having been given a human body. And of course the purpose of our life, we, we want to realize the Supreme Lord. We should try to see Krishna. We want to see Krishna and to want to see our own self. We don't want to think that we are the Supreme. We want to see ourselves different from Krishna. We are part of the Supreme, but at the same time different from Him. Mm -hmm. Now we're under the control of the Supreme Lord and the living entity you can see in his prayers, he understands that. He understands, he said, I have been blessed with this body by whose grace I can see him within and without. So within, within the womb and without, he can see the living and he can see the Supreme Lord. He can see the difference between the Lord and himself. There's the Lord who's the master and there's the living entity who's his servant. So seeing by instinct, this instinct, this will be developed due to past karma, due to past life situations, past experiences. Different living entities will have different experiences, they will develop different kinds of instinct. 
according to our instincts, you know, somebody, what is agreeable and what is disagreeable. Just like we are, as vegetarians, you know, if somebody offers us something which is non-vegetarian, it's not agreeable to us. And that we can carry that perception with us in the next life, you know, to, to have to eat something which is just not agreeable. There's some, some people, you know, from, from their childhood, they just cannot, they cannot look, they cannot take things like meat or, or uh, impure foodstuffs. They've developed that kind of taste. And the same way with, with activities like being honest and being immoral or being moral, being religious, these things are coming due to develop consciousness from previous lifetimes. Yes, Prabhu, uh, yes, Maharaj, so what you are saying is that it is by our previous natures or our likes and dislikes based on our past experiences. Yes. We have developed certain likes and dislikes and that is what is coming out here. Yes, right. Thank you, Maharaj. Going ahead, text number 20. Therefore, my Lord, although I am living in a terrible condition, I do not wish to depart from my mother's abdomen to fall again into the blind well of materialistic life. Your external energy called Deva Maya at once captures the newly born child and immediately false identification, which is the beginning of the cycle of continual birth and death begins. So, the living entity, I don't, he says, before he was praying to get out, but now he's saying, I don't wish to leave. He said, although I'm living in a terrible condition, I don't wish to depart from the abdomen, because he's so afraid of the material energy, the, dark, the blind well of material life. The external energy, the Deva Maya, captures the newborn child. So this is, <laughs> this is the interesting thing about the prayers in the womb. That initially he's praying to get out, but then he changes. When it comes time to go out, he doesn't want to go out. Because he realizes the dangers, the problems which are there. in taking birth in the material world. Text 18, this prayer of the child in the womb may be questioned by some atheistic people. How can a child pray in such a nice way in the womb of his mother? Everything is possible by the grace of the Lord. The child is put into such a precarious condition externally, but internally he is the same and the Lord is there. By the transcendental energy of the Lord, everything is possible. Hmm. Atheists, what do they know? They don't know it. They can't explain anything. The child prays, I am, I am suffering now, but when I take birth, I will immediately begin to identify with my body due to Maya's plan. I will then become a materialist and further extend my suffering. Better that I remain in this womb despite my present misery. Jai. <laughs> Better I remain. That was Sukadeva Goswami. He was thinking like that. He stayed in the womb 16 years. Then text 21. Therefore, without being agitated any more, I shall deliver myself from the darkest darkness of nations with the help of my friend, clear consciousness. Simply by keeping the lotus feet of Lord Vishnu in my mind, I shall be saved from entering into the wombs of many mothers for repeated birth and death. And then from text 21, one does not need any material arrangement to cultivate consciousness. One can cultivate consciousness anywhere and everywhere, provided 
he can always think of the Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, can be chanted even within the abdomen of one's mother. One can chant while sleeping, while working, while imprisoned in the womb, or while outside. Consciousness cannot be checked in any circumstance. This is uh, Lord Kapila's description of the living entity, movements of the living entity, how we are taking birth in different conditions. So we have to develop an attachment for the chanting of the holy name so that we'll never stop it, we'll, we'll never be checked, we'll never have difficulty. And Prabhupada is saying, you can chant anywhere, sleeping, working, even in the womb. In the womb or outside, consciousness cannot be checked. So we want to keep chanting, it's very good for us. All right, now going ahead, text 22, the living entity has taken birth, it's beginning to grow. Oh, it's not easy, you come out of the womb, Lord Kapila continued, text 22, the ten-month-old living entity has these desires even while in the womb. But while he thus extols the Lord, the wind that helps Partur uh, Ishan propels him forth with his face turned downward so that he may be born. All right, so a living entity, ten months old, he's been in the womb. And sometimes people say, well, we don't believe children in the womb are alive. They only take birth when they come out the, the womb. But from the time of conception, life is there. It is just not developed very much. Anyway, after ten months in the womb, the child is ready to take birth, and he comes out, and the wind pushes the child down, his face turned downwards, so that he com comes out of the womb, pushed down, right? Coming out head first. All of a sudden, by the wind, the child comes out with great trouble, head downward, breathless, and deprived of memory due to severe agony. Severe agony, the, power, the pain of birth, it's not very easy. A normal birth, we're talking not a C-sanction, a normal birth coming out of the, the womb, it's, there's pain there. Pain for the mother, pain for the child. It's all pain, whether it's C-sanction or not. A, a normal birth is pain, it's painful, not easy. A lot of trouble mothers go through to give birth, very difficult. So, the child also feels so much pain and difficulty. Then text 24, the child thus falls on the ground, smeared with stool and blood, and plays just like a worm germinated from the stool. He loses his superior knowledge and cries under the spell of Maya. So while the child was in the womb, he had some superior knowledge, he had remembrance of his past and he was appreciating his miserable condition and it caused him to pray to the Supreme Lord. But after he comes out of the womb, Maya acts, he loses that knowledge, he becomes forgetful very difficult situation. All right, text 25, somebody could read. Who's not read? Somebody? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. May I ask one small question? Yes, okay, question, yeah. Uh, actually, in text 21, Krishna Maharaj uh, mentioned that uh, there is no birth defect. Yes. Uh, actually, uh, it is mentioned about my friend. So my friend is referring to 
a clear consciousness that is super soul or the supreme lord yes definitely and uh, it is also mentioned in this uh, text 21 purport uh, that the illusory energy acts within the abdomen and uh, it is also saying as, as well as outside the abdomen so illusory energy inside the abdomen because of which the pain is being caused to the uh, to the child so that is the illusory energy which is basically creating trouble for the child in terms of worms biting the tender skin of the child well the illusory energy can just be the the forgetfulness of god forgetfulness of krishna and consciousness of the body Okay, so this is basically the illusory energy is acting on the uh, tender child because he is basically having uh, desires which are not aligned with the desire of the Lord. Yes. Thank you, Mom. We take birth in that condition. That's Thank you, Mom. that's why we come in the material world. Okay. All right. Go yes. ahead now, Prabhu. So we, you're going to read for us. Hare Krishna, 25. After coming out of the abdomen, the child is given to the care of persons who are unable to understand what he wants. And as he is nursed by such persons, unable to refuse whatever is given to him, he falls into undesirable circumstances. Mm. So the child comes out of the womb and he's given to persons who are unable to understand what he wants, right? The child can't, he hasn't learned to communicate. And so he's nursed, he's taken care of it. Sometimes, the, sometimes they want to feed the child, the child doesn't want to eat. Sometimes the child has got some pain, the, the, the child cannot tell the, the mother, I, I've got this pain, I've got this stomach pain, I've got problem. This is the problem the child undergoes at the time of birth. And the child, the mother will give medicine. Oh, the, the, my child has got some problem. The mother will give medicine to the child. The child doesn't want the medicine, but he can't refuse. The mother forces it into the child. And this way, this is the undesirable circumstances. There's no communication with the birth. Go on reading, Prabhu. Uh, 26. Laid down on a fall bed infested with sweet and germs, the poor child is incapable of scratching his body to get relief from his itching sensation, to say nothing of sitting up, standing or even moving. Yeah, the child is just born, so the child cannot, he cannot move for himself. He cannot stand up, he cannot sit or anything. He's just lying there, he's just born, you know, he's, he's hasn't got the ability to move and to situate himself in any condition. And he's laying there uh, covered with sweat and germs. If he has itching on the body, he can't scratch it, he can do nothing. Go ahead. In his helpless condition, Genets, mosquitoes, bugs, and other germs bite the baby whose skin is tender, just as smaller worms bite a big worm. The child, deprived of its wisdom, cries bitterly. All right, so very clear description. So many things come mosquitoes, bugs, germs, all biting the tender skin of the baby. And so, this way, the child cries so much. Go ahead. In this way, the child passes through his childhood, suffering different kinds of distress and attains boyhood. In boyhood also he suffers pain, our desires to get things he can never achieve, and thus due to ignorance he becomes angry and sorry. We would think, you know, after the birth, after we get out of the womb, the suffering would be over. No, it's, it's more suffering. Okay, well, now the child's grown up, the child learns to communicate, he can tell, he can stand up, he can do things. Is there still suffering? Yes, there's still suffering. He still suffers pain because he, he wants things which he can never get. He wants 
so many has so many desires. He wants to oh this boy's got one, I don't have one, I want the no mother won't get. So much pain, so much a child becomes angry and then, uh, so many problems, all due to ignorance. Not only children, but also elderly persons should be very careful to protect their sense of Krishna consciousness and avoid unfavorable circumstances so that they may not forget their prime duty. From text 27, purport. Okay, someone else read text 29. Uh, text number 29. With the growth of the body, the living entity, in order to vanquish his soul, increases his false prestige and anger and thereby creates enmity towards similar lusty people. Hmm. So, with the growth of the body, in order to vanquish his soul. <laughs> in other words, he doesn't, it's like we talk about Atmaha, killer of the soul. And so vanquishing his soul is, is so much in the bodily consciousness. So he increases his false prestige and anger, so much nasty feeling, so lusty. This is what growing up means. Go ahead. Text number 30. By such ignorance, the living entity accepts the material body, which is made of five elements, as himself. With the misunderstanding, he accepts non-permanent things as his own and increases his ignorance in the darkest region. Okay. So he accepts the material body. And so this is a problem. Aham and mamiti. Now I am the body, this belongs to me. Go ahead. For the sake of the body, which is a source of constant trouble to him and which follows him because he is bound by ties of ignorance and fruitive activities, he performs various actions which causes him to be subjected to repeated birth and death. All right. Thank you, Prabhu. And so you see material life. Ignorance, because of ignorance, is attached to the results of work. He's performing many activities, all activities which are going to cause him to take birth again in the material world, birth again and again. All right, now we're coming on to the next section. We're going to hear about the bad association. If therefore the living entity again associates with the path of unrighteousness, influenced by sensually minded people engaged in the pursuit of sexual enjoyment and the gratification of the palate, he again goes to hell as before. So the path of unrighteousness, meaning uncontrolled senses, particularly the desire to enjoy the opposite sex and to satisfy the belly by eating all kinds of impure food stuff. One who aspires to reach the culmination of yoga and has realized his self by rendering service unto me should never associate with an attractive woman. For such a woman is declared in the scripture to be the gateway to hell for the advancing devotee. Now, now when ladies should lead, when a Mataji reads this, she should, where it says woman, you should simply put man, right? And so far, so, so uh, you should never associate with an attractive man, for such a man is declared in the scriptures to be gateway to hell for the advancing devotee. You just have to reverse the situation, you see? Man is bad association for woman, and woman is the bad association for the man. This is text number 38, right? Lord Kapila tells his mother, just try to understand the strength of my Maya in the shape of women who, by the mere movement of her eyebrows, can keep even the greatest conquerors of the world under her grip. Right? Behind every great man, 
there's a greater woman. <laughs> so this is the power of women, the strength of, uh, the Lord said, my Maya in the shape of a woman that she can control. So we're warned about the danger of family life. We have to be careful for that. Text number 40. The woman created by the Lord is the representation of Maya. And one who associates with such Maya by accepting services must certainly know that this is the way of death, just like a blind well covered with grass. This is a, a very, very powerful section of Srimad Bhagavatam. And it's very unique, actually, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, this section. Lord Kapila is speaking very powerfully. He wants to detach all of us from material existence. Text number 41. Someone read? A living entity who as a result of attachment to a woman in his previous life has been endowed with the form of a woman foolishly looks upon Maya in the form of a man, her husband, as the bestower of the wealth, progeny, house and other material assets. Is it true? A living entity is an attachment to a woman in his previous life. So, next life, he gets the form of a woman. And the woman naturally looks upon the form of the man, her husband, to give her everything she wants. Money, children, house, it should all come from the husband, of course. Go ahead, text 42. Text 42, a woman therefore should consider her husband, her house, and her children to be the arrangement of the external energy of the Lord for her death, just as the sweet singing of the hunter is death for the deer. <laughs> Lord Kapila, is, he wants his mother to get detached from all of these attacks. You know, Devahuti's mother, she was thinking, you know, my husband gone away, my children like that. So Lord Kapila is telling her, he said, the woman should consider her husband and her house and her children, that these are the arrangements of the external energy for her death. Just like the hunter, they try to attract the deer by the sweet singing, so the hunter can kill the deer. So all of these things, these gifts which we think are so nice, this is just the energy of the Lord, just to bring about our death. Okay? So there's not a lot of time left, but we do have a little exercise which you can spend some time on today. And let's see how it goes. How many people do we have here in the class today? We have 13, Maharaj. 13. Okay, so we'll have four in one group and four in another group and then five in the other group, right? Okay, Maharaj. Three groups and there are three questions. There's Jagannath, Baladev and Subhadra. Can I open the rooms, Maharaj? All right. And uh, I still have to tell the, the questions for each group. Okay. Right, so the Jagannath... The three rooms, Maharaj, three groups. Yes. Room one, room two, room three. All right, room one, Jagannath. Room one will be Jagannath, room two will be Baladev, and room three, Subhadra. So, room one, Jagannath, your question is, association of women is the gateway to hellish life. Kindly discuss text 38 to 40 and discuss this statement. What do you have to say about it? This is the gateway to hellish life, association with women. Kindly discuss and we'll get your feedback. And then group two, Baladev group, the body of a man has greater opportunity to get out of the material clutches. 
text 41. And then group 3, Subhadra group. Women is a wonderful creation of Maya to keep the conditioned soul in shackles. You have a longer section here. You have to look through text 32 to 39. Group 2, you're only working with text 41. And group 1, you're looking at text 38, 39, 40. Is it clear? Okay. How many minutes, Maharaj? Well, five minutes, I guess. <laughs> Let's see how you do, you know. Five minutes will be less time, Maharaj. Okay, then 10 minutes. All right, I don't mind. The rooms are open, please join. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna Prabhu. So your group number two. Group number two. What's the question? Body of a man has great opportunity to get out of the material touches. Oh yes. Hmm. Verse 41. <laughs> okay, so let's have a look. I have to read the verse again. Text 41. Okay, yes. From this verse, it appears that a woman is also supposed to have been a man in his or her previous life. And due to his attachment to his wife, he now has the body of a woman. Bhagavad Gita confirms that a man gets his next life birth according to what he thinks of at the time of death. If someone is too attached to his wife, naturally thinks of his wife at the time of death, and in his next life he takes the body of a woman. Similarly, if a woman thinks of her husband at the time of death, naturally she gets the body of a man in the next life. In the Hindu scriptures, therefore, women's chastity and devotion to man is greatly emphasized. A woman's attachment to her husband may elevate her to the body of a man in her next life, but a man's attachment to a woman will degrade him, and in his next life he will get the body of a woman. We should always remember, as stated in Bhagavad Gita, both the gross and subtle material bodies are dresses, they are the shirt and coat of the living entity. To be either a woman or a man only involves one's bodily dress. The soul in nature is actually the marginal energy of the Lord. Every living entity being classified as energy is supposed to be originally a woman or one who is enjoyed. In the body of a man, there is a greater opportunity to get out of the material clutches. There is less opportunity in the body of a woman. In this verse is indicated that the body of a man should not be misused through forming an attachment to women and thus becoming too entangled in material enjoyment, which will result in getting the body of a woman in the next life. A woman is generally fond of household prosperity, ornaments, furniture and dresses. She is satisfied when the husband supplies all these things sufficiently. The relationship between man and women is very complicated, 
But the substance is that one who aspires to ascend to the transcendental stage of spiritual realization should be very careful in accepting the association of a woman. In the stage of Krishna consciousness, however, such restriction of asso association may be slackened if a man's and woman's attachment is not to each other but to Krishna, then both of them are equally eligible to get out of the material entanglement and reach the abode of Krishna. As it is confirmed in Bhagavad Gita, anyone who seriously takes to Krishna consciousness, whether in the lowest species of life, or a woman, or of the less intelligent classes, such as the mercantile or labourer class, will go back home back to Godhead and reach the abode of Krishna. A man should not be attached to a woman, nor should a woman be attached to a man. Both men and women should be attached to the service of the Lord. Then there is the possibility of liberation from material entanglement for both of them. So, Prabhupada does state that it is easier for the man. Raj, uh, as for this book, what, uh, as you illustrated, Prabhupada does say that the man has a greater opportunity. But, um, you know, in our previous classes we were discussing that the man has lesser willpower than a woman, for example. <laughs> you know, yes. uh, lesser, noticed, lesser what power? Lesser willpower, yes. More, the man has a stronger body but lesser willpower, whereas a woman has a weaker body but stronger willpower. We see in a uh, kind of life in general, even in Krishna consciousness, women, because maybe they are a bit softer, they have the tendency to take spiritual life quicker than a man. And we see this in our movement as well, you know, in terms of ratio of male and female. Is that... Definitely it's more women than men. Well, that's common in all religions, that the women in general are more pious and more devoted than the men. Yes. So in context of this question, body of man has great opportunity to get out of material touches. <laughs> I'm just taking these points in consideration. I'm trying to see how it's more favorable having a body of a man. Definitely, definitely we, we don't let women become sannyasis. Women cannot become fully renounced. They need protection. Women are supposed to be protected. That's, you know, part of the nature of women, that they, they, they need to be protected because they're more gullible and they can be taken advantage. They're, they tend to be kind-hearted and they can be exploited and cheated by unscrupulous men. And so there has to be men there to b protect them and give them shelter. And that's why women should be married. Prabhupada said like that, you know, women should be married. All you women have to get married, right? And he said, you men can yes. s stay single. <laughs> <laughs> So we have uh, 10 seconds in this room. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Who else is there? Oh my God. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Everybody's back, my edge. Well, that was really quick. Recording in progress. I, yeah, it was really too quick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Difficult to get any conclusions about that. Okay, anyway, let's hear Jagannath group. Any discussion, any comments from you? Association to, of women is the gateway to hellish life? 
Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, we, we could discuss very few points only. Uh, one point was that uh, the association of women starts with taking service from her. If men start taking any type of service, then uh, it ends with uh, deep association and then it, it, it's like a, a well covered by grass. You are just trying to move on grass, but you slip within the well. Same way if you uh, take service from the woman, then end up with mingling and all things went off. Second point, Srila Prabhupada says in uh, verse 39 that if you want to continue uh, to be exist in material world, then associate with women. So if you want to what? Say that it, it, if you want to continue uh, to remain in material world, then uh, you, you associate with women. Third point, Prabhupada was saying that uh, if, we, if we see the Vanasma Dharma, in a Vanasma, three Asma are uh, asked not to uh, associate with women. Only one ashram, uh, Grasta ashram, and that's also uh, only to uh, beget child. And Prabhupada is referring uh, the Vedic culture, even culture a few years back in India, where uh, uh, there were separate uh, places for women and men. And in daytime, women were not even allowed to see the husband. Uh, so all these things uh, Prabhupada is saying. And one important point is that uh, uh, we have to see that uh, the woman is made by Krishna. Everything is made by Krishna. So uh, Krishna made everything attractive. So uh, he is attracted. Krishna is also attracted by uh, woman, but speak in spiritual world. So he is not attracted by any mundane woman. So if someone uh, param uh, propate param deshtva nevatante, if someone is attracted by Shri Radha Rani Shri Krishna service then uh, they will not be attracted by a woman and uh, Prabhupada is referring the example of Srila Haridas Thakur and even uh, Yamuna Chare who is saying that now uh, I am attracted by Srimati Radha in Krishna past time no, no, then I just want to speak if anything uh, come in my mind relating to association of women. Mm -hmm. well, thank you very much. Yeah, very nice. Mm. So certainly there's danger there in the association with the opposite sex. All right, thank you very much, Jagannath Guru. Uh, is there, would you like to speak from the Baladev group, Prabhu? Someone from Baladev group can give their comment? Man has a greater opportunity to get out of the material clutches. Yes, Prabhu? Dineshwar Prabhu, Rajshekar Prabhu, Shri Ram Prabhu and Shri Vas Prabhu. I don't know who is going to represent the group. Please represent and speak. Want to? Hare Krishna, I'll just start off by saying a few points, maybe. Yes, go uh, ahead. Uh, the devotees can contribute. Yeah. So what we mentioned was that, you know, a man uh, can become a sannyasi. Uh, a woman has to be uh, protected. You know, Srila Prabhupada emphasized that a woman should get uh, married. Uh, these were some very important points that Maharaj actually brought up. Um, yeah. We, we didn't get a lot of opportunity to discuss, but these were just some of the points. Any of the other devotees in the group would like to contribute? So, uh, one more point was uh, uh, the male body has an opportunity to either elevate or if he's going to be too much attached to a female body, then he'll be getting a female body in the next life. So, it is better to elevate using a human uh, male body. That was one more point which came up during the discussion. Yes, Prabhupada's purport warns that people too much attached to women, they'll become a woman in the next life. And so in some ways we could say that the people who have ladies' bodies today, in their previous life they were men. But then he also says that actually men and women were all female in relation to Krishna. He said that uh, 
Krishna is the Purush and all others are Prakriti, both men and women. We're not the body, we're all the energy of Krishna and we're meant to be enjoyed by Krishna. So that's the important point, the connection has to be to Krishna. So if, um, um, if, the, if, if the men and women are strongly convinced of this, then they can get out of the clutches of material nature. One more point which was discussed in the group was that the uh, uh, women, uh, they, uh, they are not getting the uh, brahmachari. Uh, 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 yes, Krishna, right. Yeah. And, uh, men get the sannyasa. Right. Women don't take sannyasa. Women need to be protected. Women have to be, they, you know, they, they can be easily taken advantage of by unscrupulous men. And so women have to be protected. That's why Prabhupada said Vedic culture was all the women should get married and then they'll be protected. Of course, men have to be qualified to give protection to the men, to the, to the women. The men have to be qualified to take care. This is a, also a challenge. But there is an op opportunity for men to be fully detached. As we say, men can even take sannyas and they can be freed of all these material entanglements. It's a great opportunity, but it doesn't mean because they take sannyas that they will get free of material clutches. Some people take sannyas and they're in maya. You know, some people just take sannyas to avoid responsibilities just to be parasites and live off society. So we see a lot of very advanced people in householder life also. And the Mahajans, many Mahajans are Grihastas, but they're not attached to their wives. They're not attached. Although they have a wife, and they're not neglectful, they take care, but they're not attached to the sense gratification. That's the point. Okay, let's hear from the Subhadra group. Women is the wonderful creation of Maya to keep the conditioned soul in shackles. Yes, Marge, we, uh, we divided um, amongst us the, the, the different verses, so I think, um, so the okay. first verses, Guruji, you're there, you can speak and then. Yeah, yes, so actually in the first verse, uh, actually it is mentioned that uh, those who are uh, associated with the woman it is very dangerous because it will glide the person to the hellish condition because uh, that uh, binding to the hellish condition is there like there are different hells available where the soul will get punishment and in the second uh, text it was mentioned that uh, the person is not able to control the senses and the mind so when the mind and the senses are not in control all the good qualities they will not be available for spiritual development so that is how the soul is bound and secondly uh, like uh, when when the person is attached to the uh, woman uh, then he is basically uh, trying to satisfy the woman uh, without thinking the fact that uh, he has to basically work in order to satisfy the supreme god So that way he, he cannot make any progress and uh, that he, uh, he will not uh, associate if, I mean, he, then if he's only interested in material enjoyment, he will not make uh, advancement in Krishna consciousness. So that is very dangerous. It is uh, more dangerous than society. Okay. Yeah, so, so Murari Prabhuji, now you may continue for your shlokas because there are uh, eight or nine shlokas in this one. And then Murali Manohar Prabhuji would like to sum up and conclude. That will be divided, Maharaj. Yes, I had the uh, shlokas 35, 36 and 57. So there is uh, descriptions that the, how the woman is um, uh, so contaminating that uh, even uh, when somebody is uh, association uh, have a association with whom the the association with person which are associated with women uh, is uh, very contaminated. So, and uh, there was example of Brahma 
uh, which also was captivated by his uh, daughter and uh, Lord Shiva who was captivated by uh, Mohini Murti. So the, uh, the example was given even if such big personalities uh, are captivated by the woman, so what say about us, like uh, ordinary living entities? And uh, <clears throat> also was the description that uh, to the material world, there is no one uh, uh, without this attraction of sex life, expect uh, the sage of Narada Muni. So there was, uh, uh, how to say, uh, for, for one who wants to, to go out from a conditional life, it, there, he must be detached from association woman of women. And so therefore the Vedic uh, civilization is uh, was divided in this four ashramas and we can see that in uh, three ashramas uh, there is uh, completely forbidden to associate with the uh, women in but in only one there was uh, possible to associate with women in a uh, restricted condition so we can see from this uh, how dangerous it is <laughs> Okay, thank you, Prabhu. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Um, yeah, I'll then speak, um, just summarizing texts 38 and 39. Um, the verse um, asks us, or it, it asks us to look in to the strength of this Maya, how um, it's in the form of a woman for a man, and, and as we know, vice versa, described by the movement of her eyebrows. It can capture even the greatest conqueror. And Prabhupada in the purple, he alludes to uh, Cleopatra, I think, who is Mark Antony, who was attracted to Cleopatra when he was trying to become a, a ruler of Rome. So, and then Prabhupada speaks about, um, then he addresses the, that actual potency by which a woman has to attract the man. And then he explains, then he, Prabhupada, be, uh, quotes Janma Diya that actually is coming from the absolute truth. And then the Prabhupada goes on to explain um, that Krishna himself, um, he wants to be attracted by a female because that, because the, that propensity is here because it's there, Janma Diya So then he brings up now the question, just quoting you. Now the question is, if he wants to be captivated by such woman attraction, can he be attracted by anything material? No, he can't. So, therefore, um, and then he gives the example of, of Haridas Thakur, who was tried to be a lord by a prostitute. So he was completely detached from um, material womanly beauty. So that was a test of that Haridas Thakur. Instead, he was, and Prabhupada ultimately brings it to the point if we're attracted to Radha Krishna, because um, Radharani is the internal potency, so Krishna is attracted to that. He's not attracted to anything material, and that is completely pure. And um, so Prabhupada is encouraging us to be, instead of attracted to material beauty, we should be attracted to Radha Krishna. So he says, this is the special significance of Radha Krishna worship. And then he also quotes Yamamuda Acharya, um, Yad Abadi Mama Krishna Tita Pada Vindei, where he was a king and probably had he had many wives and led a sensual life, but then he gave that all up as being untasteful, being attracted to Radha Krishna. And then in text 39, um, it's described that um, one aspires to reach cultivation of yoga should never associate with an attractive woman because it's a gateway to hell. Then in the purple, Prabhupada brings up the bogus yoga practice, which sometimes put forward to enjoy your senses as a means for ultimately attaining some type of perfection. So Prabhupada explains that these are just rascals, <laughs> he explains. And then he begins to explain what you heard before about the science of the Vedic civilization where, where association with 
women is um, controlled. It's like it's scientifically dealt with in order to assist the process of spiritual realization. And explains brahmacharya, vanaprastha, and sannyasi. They are prohibited from associating with women. Yeah, so that's just a quick summary of this wonderful purpose Prabhupada gives in these verses as well. That's a quick summary of those two verses, 38, 39. Okay, thank you very much, Prabhu. Very nice, yes. Very wonderful creation of Maya. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. Okay, so just a little more. We'll just try to finish this chapter. Text 47. Therefore, one should not view death with horror, nor have recourse to defining the body as soul, nor give way to exaggeration in enjoying the bodily necessities of life. Realizing the true nature of the living entity, one should move about in the world, free from attachment and steadfast in purpose. Then 48. Endowed with right vision and strengthened by devotional service and a pessimistic attitude towards material identity, one should relegate his body to this illusory world through his reason. Thus, one can be unconcerned with this material world. This is a very nice concluding verse here. You see, indifferent to the material world, pessimistic attitude about material identity. Very nice. We want to develop these kind of qualities. And here we see the real beauty of the, the, the world. Instead of being attracted by material beauty, if one is accustomed to be attracted by the beauty of Srimati Radharani and Lord Krishna, then the statement of Bhagavad Gita, Param Drisva Nivartate, holds true. When one is attracted by the transcendental beauty of Radha and Krishna, he is no longer attracted by material feminine beauty. That is the special significance of Radha Krishna worship. From the purport, text number 38. Okay. Are there any questions? Um, um, yes? Maharaj, may I uh, ask you something with folded hands? Okay. Uh, may I ask you for your blessing so that we can please bless us so that we don't uh, take birth again and we, we, may, we may go back to Godhead. <laughs> yes, I wish I could. <laughs> Very nice. May your mind always be on Krishna. So we bless you, Krishna Matirvastu. If your mind is always on Krishna, then you won't have to take birth again. That's, that's the idea. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes, any, any other question, comment? Maharaj, may I ask? Yes. Maharaj, in text 29, it is mentioned that the living entity, in order to vanquish his soul, so, living entity, why would he like to vanquish his own soul? Because he would like to defend his uh, soul for uh, protecting his body or soul, the, the self-defense mechanism. Well, it's, I, I mentioned that about the, the killer of the soul. If we deny the actual, na the actual nature of the soul, if we're in the bodily concept of life, then we're also killers of the soul, of course. And so, the, Neglecting the soul, it's the same thing, that we're denying this, our spiritual nature and we're just only thinking about ourselves as a material body. So our focus is on material life, the bodily conception, satisfying the senses. I am the body and these senses are mine and my senses enjoy that this is my happiness. So this is killing the soul, this is the giving up the conception of the soul. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, and in, uh, Maharaj, like in previous chapter, there was uh, there were two terms which you had explained last time. Prakshayat Atmika and... Uh, uh, oh, yes, yes. Abharatmika, Abhara Abhara yes. Yeah, so there are two functions of this material energy. One is basically the knowledge of the living entities covered 
and second is that the conditioned soul is satisfied with him with his, with his current species so that is the meaning of prakshya atmika because that prakshya atmika is very similar to avaran atmika and avaran atmika is the covering of the knowledge of the soul but prakshya atmika is basically satisfied in his own self uh, in sense enjoyment or how is it different from avaran atmika yeah the the, the the it's different the sense it, it's referring to the initial phase of the mind that were thrown out of the of the spiritual existence that so were thrown out into the material world it's that it's that initial ejection from the spiritual existence coming into the material existence and then the longer we stay in the material existence then the more we become covered so it's that initial entrance into the realm of maya coming into the material conception of life so initial initial entrance means that it is subject like like avaranatmika is the covering of the knowledge of the soul yeah and prakshya atmika is basically uh, i didn't understand maharaj prashak atmika is the initial entrance into the material world the phase of actually coming into the material existence and giving up our spiritual identity and coming into the material consciousness so it's the initial phase first we we come out of the of the spiritual nature we come into this the material realm and then we then the avaranatmika is the the covering the layer the covering is increased more and more but the prakshak atmika this is the initial entrance into the material energy into that material illusion yes maharaj so uh, once uh, once it enters then more and more he gets subjected to the uh, knowledge being covered by maya yes yes thank you maharaj Okay. Yes. Any other questions? Yes. Maharaj, can I ask? Yes. Uh, I want to ask that uh, it uh, seems that, uh, like from this, that uh, we ha we are overcome by the last, like the living entity, and uh, the way from this is like to to have the attraction for the Lord. but uh, like for myself i can see that uh, i am not on the one side or, or the second side i am just somewhere in between you know that the still uh, fully of lusty desires but still somehow attracted to the lord and uh, the question is that the uh, how to or, or what what can help us to be you know be more attracted to the lord than to these lusty desires just the just this that we have the knowledge about this how this function or you know some practical application or well simply the process of devotional service applying ourselves into the into the wholeheartedly into the service of the lord hearing and chanting we have to hear and chant except for a long time we have to really concentrate and focus on that hearing and chanting and we have to also pray to the lord praying to the lord and uh, said the uh, lusty desires we can take shelter of the four kumaras and taking shelter of the four kumaras they can help us to conquer lusty desires then offering prayers like that and uh, this also cultivating our spiritual knowledge you know certainly hearing shrimad bhagavatam and studying it carefully will help us we should understand the nature of lust what is lust what is the where is it coming from it's due to our identification with the material body so we want to be careful to keep our mind always absorbed in remembering krishna constantly you know reciting verses and remembering past times and discussing topics of krishna in the association of devotees we want to be very careful about avoiding bad association also 
as we are hearing, the danger of bad association. If you associate with people who are very materialistically inclined, then it will be very bad, very dangerous for us. We'll become influenced by them. If people are very materialistic and very lusty, it's very bad for us to associate with them. So you have to be careful, and you have to be careful about doing things like, you know, mundane talk, mundane gossip and reading mundane newspapers or watching movies and these kind of things. All these things are very harmful for our consciousness. Right? We've been in the material world a long time and we have a lot of contamination there. If we want to get rid of all this contamination, we have to work hard. It's going to, Rupa Goswami describes, utsahan nistaya dairya, enthusiasm, patience, determination. These things, very important. Then strictly following principles like hearing and chanting, avoiding the association of non-devotees, means you have to get the association of good devotees, strict devotees. Yeah? Yes, thank you, Maharaj. Okay. So you can reflect on this if you're doing anything, you know, that you shouldn't be doing, maybe something. So there, you know, some bad habits are there, you have to give them up, you have to get rid of them. Mm, you know, of course, before we became devotees, before coming to Krishna consciousness, we had a lot of bad association and a lot of bad habits. We have to get free from that, from these tendencies. It takes some time to remove that kind of influence. So it's, it's endeavor, constant endeavor, constantly hearing, chanting, really endeavoring to absorb our mind in thoughts of Krishna. Wake up early in the morning, chant carefully. Yes, Prabhu? Okay, so I hope that's some help to you, Prabhu. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, may I, may I request one uh, humble prayer unto your lotus feet? Yes. Yes, yesterday was your Vyas Puja, very auspicious day, uh, so we came to know, so we request uh, to kindly forgive our offences, whatever we have committed in the in your holy uh, lotus feet, and kindly, uh, I, I, I sincerely pray from the bottom of my heart, so that we, uh, we receive your blessings for advancing in Krishna consciousness, because our mind is very uh, turbulent, and it is like a turbulent aeroplane in the air, where we feel a lot of problem and mind is very, really very, very turbulent. It, is, it causes a lot of pain and problem and challenge to basically uh, attract and get directed towards Krishna and his devotees. So please uh, bless us, all the devotees, so that we can make good progress and maybe uh, we, we, uh, we make you also feel happy that we are your students and we, you feel that, okay, you are spending, giving us so much of time and uh, helping us learn Srimad Bhagavatam. So that we can advance in devotional service, we can please you, we can please Krishna Maharaj. So that is my humble and sincere prayer unto your Lotus Feet Maharaj. No, oh, you're very humble. So I also pray to you <laughs> that I can pray to you that I can also do some service for Srila Prabhupada. We're all servants, we're just trying to serve Srila Prabhupada's mission and somehow push on this mission of Krishna consciousness. Wherever we are, whatever humble service we can do, we pray to Krishna to help us and guide us in this mission. So thank you all very much. Okay, so we'll see you next week and we'll continue chapter 32 and Sunday 33. Okay? Shri Maharaj, please bless us Maharaj. Maharaj, one additional prayer required Maharaj. As we were discussing today, so so big topic, and personally, Maharaj, I feel so many bad habits, and I am not able to get rid of it. Please bless Maharaj, please, so okay. that uh, I can get rid of and I can serve. Okay, yeah, we'll pray. <laughs> Very humble. Maharaj.
Okay, thank you all very much. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada ki. Gore back to Vrinda ki. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.